first years, like now, basically years of a mixture of things. Uh, adjustment, of course, um, learning the ropes. It was a very steep learning curve and you had to learn fast because we didn't have a lot of time. I really had to, to work fast. There was a lot to do. It was exciting. You know, Tati was a student leader. In fact, she was one of the 10 outstanding students of the Philippines in her youth. So whatever ethos of that student leadership, the Catholic action type, she brought to the government service. She's very committed. There are many assignments, I think, that are overwhelming, but she just takes them. So the commitment, the integrity, which is very important in government service, and working beyond the call of duty. We're commissioners, right? We are a collegial body, and we had a lot of autonomy to pursue the programs, right? carry out the programs, and carry out all the strategies necessary. She was very open to different ideas coming from the different people who were conceptualizing, or at least even, even implementing some of the programs. So she was part of the conceptualization, but she gave a lot of freedom. I, I, that was what I appreciate most about that, is the autonomy. When we first came in, we we said, you know, we don't have to study the education system anymore. It has been so well studied. And what was very well documented were certain persistent problems that have plagued the country and various administrations for decades, no? since the early 90s. So essentially, we tried to work on access. We tried to work on improving quality. We tried to make the system more and our institutions more competitive. No? and also we had to work on ethical governance. In terms of access, the third university and college system is a major instrument for access no, for poor and deserving students. So we tried to help support SOOCs, as we call them, improving their quality, improving their, their facilities, no, so that the students there would have access to better quality. We tried to expand and uh, experiment with certain types of student financial assistance, expanding the amounts uh, that we had lobbied for and we finally got a bill, a, a law through to rationalize all of the public assistance for students because we found out that all the different agencies have funds to give you know, for as financial assistance to students. So. The UNIFAST law, which was passed, no, and that we now have a UNIFAST board, is working on that. And then we experimented with certain types of assistance for poor students. We had won the student grants in aid for poverty alleviation, was really targeting the poorest of the poor. Most scholars and grantees are poor, but most of the really poor do not get into college. No? So what we did was we used the conditional cash transfer families. We started with 4,000, then it expanded to 40,000. So that's still not enough, but we hope now with, with UNIFAST that we would be able to make sure that the agencies keep part of their student financial assistance for the poorest of the poor. I'm quite moved by this because I saw that, you know, helping these disadvantaged students catch up. Two years ago, we had our first graduates. First of all, the survival rate was over 80% of those who started did finish, and many of them finished with honors. Really, it was very, very inspiring. So it shows that talent, intelligence is actually distributed normally, but opportunities are terribly skewed. Some higher education institutions have to be able to compete, have to help the country compete globally. No? Not all of them, but some of them. And how do we do that? Well, we have to really work on research and development no? so that the higher education institutions will produce more innovation so that we can be more globally competitive. Indicators for competitiveness in ASEAN, in Asia, we do quite badly. And so we launched the Philippines California Advanced Research Institute project, where we brought together, we brokered partnerships between top Philippine universities and 
the University of California system. What they've done is that they've developed with Philippine researchers and California researchers research projects that are relevant to the Philippine needs. We work with various types of industries and they tell us the types of skills, whatever knowledge that is needed, and they work with our technical panels. We have supported a large number of faculty. I think as of now, we have about 10,000 that have been supported for masters and PhDs, both locally and abroad. You know? And because that is one of the weaknesses of Philippine education, our faculty do not have the graduate degrees that they should have. So part of the grants has to do with the scholarships for faculty members across the country to different, to the abroad as well as locally. It also has grants for faculty immersion in industry, in research, in extension. It has grants for the innovations of the schools. So basically those are all to help develop the capacity in terms of programs. Many of these programs have long-lasting benefits, if, especially if they're followed through and if they are implemented next administration. You see, because it was a reformist administration, that is was a reformist administration. So there was a higher education reform agenda. I sincerely believe that there's nothing like a government job for potential impact. I have always loved my jobs. They have been very fulfilling and sometimes, you know, I, <laughs> I wonder what I'm doing here. But you do see that there is movement and when it is government and you have somehow your reach is so much wider, then you say, okay, it's worth it, you know. There's a lot to be done. As I said, it's humongous and chaotic, so it has to be rationalized a lot more. So maybe, um, you know, we have too many institutions. Uh, we could afford to have less of higher quality. Well, I, as I said, it's, it's very daunting. It's very inspiring. No? I like my job. <laughs>